Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for, for, for today's uh, weekly outlook. Uh, we, have a, we have several stockholder updates, uh, and we'll be wrapping things up with Singapore Weekly. Without further ado, I'll start off with Manulife US Read. Okay, this is Manulife's first half 2021 uh, results. So for the first half of 2021, DPU of 2.70 US cents uh, was in line. Uh, forming 47.5% of our FY21 estimates. We'll start off with the table on the left-hand side. We see that gross revenue actually fell by 7.5%. This was due to lower portfolio occupancy of 91.6% in 1H21 versus 96.2% um, in 1H20. So the lower physical occupancy um, in the first half of the year re actually reduced the car park income which declined by about 43% year on year. Moving down to the next line, just net property income, um, there was 2.4% um, of rents that were actually uh, given reliefs. So this um, reliefs actually lowered the MPI, uh, and not to mention uh, it was partially offset by the reversal of some expected credit losses. So overall, DPU actually fell by 11.5%. Okay. Uh, moving on to the, po to the positives, uh, we saw that leasing momentum was up uh, and it continued from first, half, uh, first quarter. So in the second quarter, physical tours actually uh, doubled quarter on quarter. 6.5% uh, of NLA was signed for the whole, whole first half of 2021. And as the lease negotiations uh, went on, the management no noted that more tenants were willing to sign longer five and seven year leases. The second positive will be the rental collection. It remained high at 99%. Of course, 2.4% um, of rental reliefs was given to tenants. Uh, moving on to the negatives. So Manulife actually registered positive reversions uh, for the first half of 2021. However, um, the market still very much remains a tenant's market. So the reversions for the second quarter was actually slightly negative, 3.7%. Uh, um, however, for the first half, um, it was positive at one, uh, positive 1.3%. One okay. So in the US, um, they have, they have uh, certain incentives, such as the rent-free period, as well as some tenant incentives for, uh, which is an allowance for, for the tenants to uh, do their own uh, fit out before they move into the space. So these rent-free and uh, tenant incentives actually increased by 20 to 30% for renewals and it doubled for new leases signed. So uh, what this means is that the effective net rents were 10 to 15% below pre-pandemic below pre -pandemic levels. Portfolio occupancy declined by 0.3 uh, and 4.8 percentage points quarter on quarter and year on year respectively. So that brings the portfolio occupancy to 91.7%. Gearing crept up by 2.5 percentage points year on year to 41.6% on declining valuations. So uh, if you compare valuations to what they were at the end of 2019 as well as 2020, um, valuations were 5.9% and 1.1% lower. Now moving on to the outlook. So the, the US office market uh, is showing signs of stabilizing. Um, in terms of leasing volume, it has increased by 28.7% quarter on quarter, and is now currently at 73% of 1Q20's levels. The net effective rents for class A assets um, is also on the uptrend. It increased by about 5.2% quarter on quarter, and is currently now at 95.5% of uh, one quarter, uh, first, first quarter 2020's levels. Um, the pace of subleasing uh, was also down by about 80% uh, year on year to 4.5% of existing stock. Uh, not to mention some of the forward uh, rent, rent forecast by um, some of the property, property consultants, it has actually become less negative uh, than what they were three months ago. Return to office will help to lift performance. Physical occupancy was 11% uh, and 15% uh, for, for the first quarter and second quarter, respectively. 
Okay, so this is expected to reach about 60 to 70% uh, in third quarter and fourth quarter. Uh, and on this was this is of course based on internal surveys uh, conducted by the management. So this higher occupancy, of course, will lead to you know, better car park income as well as better retail trading for, for some of their retail tenants. And hopefully this, this would mean that you know, less, less rental relief needs to be provided as well as you know, less uh, provision for, for credit losses. Overall, the supply for um, Manulife's sub-markets remain favorable. Not, not a lot of comparable supply that is coming up in, these, in their, in their sub-markets. We are downgrading our call from buy to accumulate with an unchanged target price of uh, 84 US cents. Uh, in, this, in this note, we actually lowered our FY21 DPU slightly by 4.8% after taking in rental reliefs and slightly lower occupancy. DPU yields for FY21 and 22 are 7.5% and 8%. However, in, in the sector, we prefer prime, uh, which we have a accumulate call on. Uh, due to greater tenant exposure to new economy sectors, which are, for example, your STEM and your TEMI sectors. Okay, so that's all for Menu Life. I'll now hand the time over to Tiehui for HRNet. Thanks, Ned. So next, we have HRNet Group's first half results. Next, please. Um, first half revenue and gross profit was in line, but net profit and bad meat exceeded estimates. This is mainly due to the disposal of financial assets and higher than expected pandemic relief grants that were granted, which contributed to the 66% year-on-year increase in other income, if you can look to your um, table on your right. SG&A expenses were also lower than expected. Revenue and gross profit increased by over 30% year on year, coming from a lower base. But long story short, there is a general pickup in hiring activity as companies were getting out of their hiring freezes back in 2020. And due to the lockdowns that, were, that are in place in neighboring countries, less um, foreign workers are able to return to Singapore. As such, we are seeing a greater demand for workers while the supply pool tightens, which benefited their permanent recruitment and flexible staffing business segments. So to give you more color, um, in terms of the permanent recruitment business segments, volumes have yet to return to pre-pandemic pre levels. But that's it, revenue from this segment increased by 25%, and this is due to greater rates per placement as um, HRNet filled more senior and niche positions that commanded higher remuneration. On the other hand, um, the flexible staffing volumes have hit an all-time high of, of 17,000, which is 47% which is higher than that of last year. This is thanks to its recoup first business expansion over the past two years and the trend of clients preferring flexible staffing for manpower flexibility amid business uncertainties. As such, if you can see um, in the next point, the key markets in Singapore, North Asia and, and the rest of Asia perform well, led by growth in both segments. In terms of sector of performance, uh, we see a stronger hiring in the healthcare sector. It, con it used to contribute 15% to overall revenue in first half 20, but in this half year, we are seeing the contribution increase to 26%. This sector serves pharmaceutical firms, hospitals, and um, vaccination centers. So in case you are wondering um, if the hiring of vaccination nurses may drop off as Singapore, um, is, uh, as Singaporeans are progressively vaccinated, it's good to note that um, this uh, yeah, okay. Uh, it's good to note that um, they only contribute 2% to revenue. Furthermore, um, demand for medical staff is still expected to come through in various forms, such as small nurses in hospitals, um, social distancing ambassadors, and temperature scanners at the airport. As Singapore um, gradually reopens borders for, vaccination, for vaccinated travelers, and a third booster shot for better immunity is within sight. Hiring in the healthcare sector is not expected to pull back in the near term. Next, please. So for the negative, um, there were lesser pandemic-related assistance in first half 21. We expect pandemic-related assistance to diminish by the end of FY21, which will leave about 4 to 5 million of government grants from the wage credit scheme. We believe that this scheme will continue to support HRNet's bottom line, given that the scheme has been introduced um, and extended since 2013. We are expecting a positive outlook for HRNet as various um, Asian economies commence their recovery with the aid of vaccination programs. Pent up demand from 2020's hiring freeze is expected to unleash job openings and employment churns. So, being a market leader in Singapore um, in terms of revenue and profits, we remain optimistic uh, that HRNet will be able to ride the rush for employment. 
as such, we maintain buy with a higher target price of, of $1.05. Um, we leave our FY21 revenue and gross profits by 1.8% and 1.1% on the back of higher than expected taxable staffing contributions. We also lowered um, our SG&A expenses. So after adjusting for the one-off like the, dis the, like the disposal of financial assets and um, pandemic grants, our FY21 call per me increases by 8.8%. Accordingly, our TP climbs to $1.05 from $1. This is still set at 14 times FY21 X cash PE, which is HRNet's historical five-year high um, as we anticipate labor market recovery and potential m &As. So this is all for HRNet. I'll pass my time on to Terence for Sam Corp. Thanks, Jie Kui. The title of our uh, report is Impact Profitability because the latest impairment on their, their, their joint venture actually impact their profit, the overall profitability and drag their, their profitability to be a bit lower than our forecast. In our next slide, uh, a summary of their first half 21 results. Revenue was ahead of our expectations at 57% of our full year 21 estimates. Uh, net profit, however, uh, like what we mentioned earlier on, because of the impairment, missed at 14.7% of our financial year 21 estimates, dragged down by a $212 million impairment for its 49% owned JV, Chongqing Songzhao. So if you look at the, the table here on your left-hand side, if you look at the, the fifth row, you can see that net profit before exceptional items was actually up 69% on a year-on-year -year basis, reflecting really the, the underlying uh, resilience of their, their, their business. But when you look at the, the row below the, that, that table, so it's a little bit small, but if, if we drag it, you impact the... The, the, the graphics. But if you look at the net profit from continuing operations, instead of $252 million, when you, impact, when you take into account the $212 impairment, it, it actually got lower. It, it actually became lower to become $46 million instead. So without this impairment, of it, the, the underlying business will have been more resilient, driven by the higher contributions from all key revenue segments, uh, mainly and mainly from the conventional energy segment. In terms of the second positives, the SEMCOP industries continue to make strides in the renewable segment, which is the key segment that they're trying to grow. Turnover in this segment was up 7% on a year-on-year -year basis due to increased solar capacity in Singapore and higher revenue storage in the UK. Their target of deriving 70% of net profit from sustainable solutions by 2025 remain unchanged. In our next slide, we talk about some of the negatives in their first half 21 results. 212 million dollars of impairment was provisioned for 49% owned uh, joint venture Chongqing Songzhao. Chongqing Songzhao is actually a 1,320 megawatt mine mouth coal-fired power plant in Chongqing. So this impairment dragged down their overall net profit. The planned maintenance shutdowns in the second half of 2021, along with weaker demand, is also expected to impact their second half 2021 results. The planned maintenance shutdowns are for their Singapore Energy from Waste Plant, same called Minyang Power Plant in Myanmar, which are a little bit higher than what we modeled. The reason why it's a little bit higher than what we modeled this, this maintenance shutdown was because of the absence of any meaningful uh, maintenance last year during the, the COVID shutdown. The lower wind speeds in India, uh, along with despite that, that, that because of the lower wind speeds in India, uh, and, and even though there was higher in stock capacity, contributions were in, from India were a bit lower. Uh, wind speeds in India uh, remained below their 20 year average of 5.51, re resulting in a lower turnover. So, India continues to be weak for the group, now, which is always their Achilles heel. In our last slide, uh, the, the longer term outlook for SEMCOP industries remains challenging due to intense competition from other global utility companies and the, uti and the expiry of long-term contracts. These long-term contracts is expected to affect PEPNI by around $100 million in the next five years. Impact of earnings is expected in Singapore and Vietnam as the natural gas contracts in Singapore approach expiry in 2028 and as a full MY3 power plant in Vietnam faces reducing tariff as its purchase power agreement approaches expiry in 2024. So we maintain a neutral call on Samcoin Industries with a lower target price of $2.01. We, we provided here uh, this, this, this roadmap uh, of how Samcoin Industries intend to transform their business from brown to green. Uh, but this is ongoing and, and will take time. And, and in order for them to reach their, their green transformation, uh, CAPEX is expected to be elevated in the next four to five years. So our target price will be packed to one times 
uh, financial year 21 book value. The financial year 21 earnings we reduced by 34% as we begin in payments of $212 million and lower conventional energy profits uh, in the second half of 2021. Consequently, our target price moves lower to $2.01 from $2.07. That's all from me for Samco Industries. I'll now hand over the time to Vivian. Thanks, Terence, and good morning, everyone. So um, I will now be touching a summary on um, Golden Energy and Resources or GEAR's first half 21 results. And this is a Philip on the ground and we do not have coverage on the counter. So firstly, if you refer to the table on your left, the revenue increased by 36% for first half 21 to 806 million US dollars. This um, breakdown only has energy coal and metallurgical coal which in total contributed to 99.9% .9 of their total revenue. So for energy coal, or also known as thermal coal, um, the revenue increased 27.7%. And um, you can see in the red box highlighted, the sales volume only slightly increased from 16.7 to 16.84 million tons. But for the average ICI4 prices, it increased from 30.61 to 47.78 US dollars per ton. So um, this ICI4, this ICI means Indonesian Coal Index, and the Indonesian Coal Index reflects the swap price of five key grades of Indonesian coal. So there is ICI1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So ICI1 is the highest grade, which means um, it represents for the coal, um, there is 6,500 kilocalories per kg, which is the highest. And for ICI4, it is at 4,200 um, kilocalories per kg. So this kilocalories is um, the unit for the quantity of heat produced from the combustion. So for energy coal, um, in the process of the combustion, you will get steam, which is used to uh, turn your turbines to generate electricity for the um, power grids and all that. And um, on the other hand, for mad coal, or metallurgical coal, it is mainly used to um, in the process of producing iron ore and steel. So the increase in the ICI4 prices is what um, pushed the higher ASPs, pushed the ASPs up, if you refer to the first point on your right, to $42.56 per ton, and this increased 28% 28, 28 year on year. Recently, the ICI4 price has increased even further so the average um, in first half of 21 was 47.78, but as at 18th of August, it increased to $71.45 per ton. There is also higher contribution from Met Coal, as you can see from 16.7 to um, 72 million US dollars due to the consolidation of stem moss results. For the cash cost, it remained unchanged at $22.53 per ton. Another point to note would be the increase in the minority interest, which increased from um, 18.5 million to 51.1 million US dollars in uh, first half of 21. So this was the reason that even though the net profit after tax more than doubled, uh, if you can see the second last line on the table, um, it more than doubled to 18 million, but the pet me, which is um, after deducting the minority interest only increased 76% to 29 million US dollars. So on the outlook, um, due to the continued Sino-Australia geopolitical tensions, China has been buying more coal from Indonesia instead of Australia. And on the Indonesia side, um, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources or MEMR increased their national coal production target by 75 million tons to 625 million tons. So with the increased demand and also higher prices, as I mentioned previously, um, it could be an even better second half of 2021. So that's all for gear. I will now be moving on to Enotech. Again, this is a Philip on the ground for their first half 21 results, and we do not have coverage on the counter. So for Enotech, they are a precision metal components manufacturer with three main segments, automobile, under which they produce the car components, and um, second one is office automation, which is OA, and also consumer electronics, under which they mainly produce TV and display products. They have five manufacturing facilities in China and one in Thailand. So moving on to the results, if you refer to the first point um, under results, the revenue increased by 5.8%, net profit before tax increased by 8%, 
but the net profit after tax increased by about 94%. And this was mainly due to the tax reversal. So without the tax reversal, um, which is one of um, net profit after tax or pet me for InnoTech would have been up about um, 40% instead of the 94% here. So gross profit margins um, were impacted by higher raw material and labor costs. Next, if we zoom in to the individual segments for the automobile sector, they saw increased sales. So if you refer to the graphics on your top right, we can see that the contribution from the auto sector increased from 32% to 44%, represented by the dark blue bars of the pie charts. And moving on to the OA sector, there was recovery in first half 21, but this recovery slowed in the second quarter due to the shortage of chips and other electronic components. They also saw lower demand for the large copiers that you use in um, the offices. The last segment for TV and display products, the revenue declined in first half of 2021. So two um, factors to consider. One is that InnoTech decided not to pursue the low margin, large size TV back panel business. And the second um, factor would be that in, the, in Hong Kong and China, where they derive the bulk of their revenue from, stay home restrictions have eased as compared to first half 2020. So there is also lower demand for this kind of home entertainment products. Moving on to the outlook, um, we expect the second half to be challenging with the continued shortage of electronic components and chips, and also higher raw material and labor costs that they have to bear. At the same time, they are expanding their production facilities with this China plus one strategy. So more companies with manufacturing facilities in China are acquiring additional facilities in the Southeast, Southeast Asian region with Vietnam being a popular destination. So this is um, for InnoTech, this is to prepare for when the components shortage ease and more orders start to come in. Lastly, for InnoTech, we are also expecting them to um, possibly diversify their revenue sources to other sectors like gaming, etc. That's all for InnoTech. Um, I'll be now moving on to the last counter for me, um, UMS Holdings. So again, this is a flip on the ground for their first half 21 results, and we do not have coverage on the counter. So for UMS, um, they provide equipment manufacturing and engineering, engineering services to the OEM of semiconductors. And they also do electromechanical assembly and te final testing devices. So if you refer to the graph on your bottom left, you can see that the results, um, for the results, the revenue increased 55% to $116 million. And the first half revenue actually surpassed the half yearly revenue mark of 100 million for the first time in history. So they have two sectors. Firstly, for semiconductor and component sales, this um, revenue from this sector was driven by robust capex from global foundries and also the buildup of semicon production infrastructure, have, which we have been seeing in the news. And for aerospace, this is due to the consolidation of JEP's semicon component business. So JEP has been a subsidiary of UMS from the second quarter of 2021. This business segment does precision engineering for parts used in aerospace and also oil and gas industries. And you can also see from the graph that operating expenses and pet me both increased in line with higher revenue. Lastly, on the outlook, um, seasonality wise, second half is usually stronger than the first half, but um, UMS is facing manufacturing challenges in Penang due to the COVID restrictions. So they are still operating at 60% um, capacity. And of course, we will be expecting them to allocate this 60% um, to workers who have to work on site, for example, to operate the machines and um, employees who could work from home, like your admin or finance and HR to work from home. And other than that, the facility in Singapore is also operational. So that could also provide partial support. Lastly, there is positive guidance from their key customer which we think that UMS provides, uh, sorry, produces applied Endura machines for. The key customer um, announced that they expect net sales for fourth quarter of, 20, of FY 2021 to be 6.33 billion US dollars. And this is up from the 6.2 billion US dollars achieved in the third quarter of financial year 21. So that's all for UMS Holdings. Um, I'll now be passing the time on to Paul. 
Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Vivian. I'll move on to uh, Comfort Delgro. So for Delgro, uh, uh, Delgro's result, first half results, uh, it, the recovery looks a bit clearer, uh, especially as we go into this endemic stage. Uh, in terms of the positives or the results, was was just the rebound. I mean, we saw a rebound of at least 14%, which is expected. But, but uh, the, the main positive was the operating leverage. So you can see from the table, uh, I mean, uh, from the uh, written comments there, that uh, revenue increased 208 uh, million. But uh, at the bottom, you can see that EBIT was up 154 million. So you can see the huge operating leverage. Uh, almost three quarter of the revenue uh, went into the uh, into earnings, and, and that's because they got a large fixed cost. Uh, no, uh, if you if you look at the Comfort Douglas PNL, the biggest cost would be uh, depreciation, of course, and also uh, maintenance, which is also you no know, roughly uh, roughly kind of uh, flat. So, so as a result of this, you get this big leverage when no uh, things recover uh, and transport activities improve. Uh, the other positive was the free cash flow, which has been the highlight for me. I think as we enter through the pandemic, actually the balance sheet uh, uh, strengthened further. Certainly can't really say that for quite a few of the other transport companies, especially the airline tra transport companies. But anyway, uh, so the first uh, free cash flow actually improved uh, from 287 from 189. And they also uh, announced a two and two point one cents dividend, but but this is still below. I think a year ago, pre pandemic, the dividends was four point five, so they still have a long way to go to kind of uh, normalize the dividends. Uh, we, uh, in terms of capex, I think will be below the pre pandemic levels because I think they only have a few uh, hundred units of hybrid taxis to replace. And and just as a refresh, I think uh, you probably won't be seeing the normal diesel or you know, uh, type taxis anymore. Uh, everything will be hybrid because hybrid you can get a higher rental from the taxi drivers. Uh, but at the same time, the taxi taxi uh, drivers can get uh, savings from fuel. So everything is going to be replaced with hybrid in, in for comfort at least. So in terms of the results, it was within our expectations, you know, uh, around almost fifty percent. Uh, and the outlook is that uh, we, it will be second half will also continue to improve. I think you will see the operating leverage at number one that we highlighted. Uh, end of lockdowns uh, as, as more people return to work. Uh, all these will be the key drivers for revenue. And, uh, and also just to give you some sense of what happened uh, in the first half. Uh, so first half, taxi is still hit by rebates. So in the first quarter, rebates was, first, was 20%. Uh, rebates means you know if you charge a taxi, uh, uh, let's say example, just hundred dollars rental a day, so you actually can only charge eighty dollars because you got to give a rebate or a discount, and because with the phase two HA, this rebates went up to almost, around thirty five percent, but I think it's going to end I think this month, so you you can get this uh, revenue jump in the second half because I mean touch wood, hopefully the the the, snow, the lockdowns will not return and then you can you can get this uh, reduction in rebates or discounts. Uh, so we maintain a buy on you know, unchanged target price. Uh, the next share price catalyst, again, this is a, a bit speculative because we have no idea when the timeline, uh, not like the authorities are going to tell us, but uh, they, if there is a restructuring of the downtown line under the new real financing network, whereby, you know, the, the traffic, uh, right now, uh, the, the model for Comfort Delgro or I mean, SBS Transit is that uh, they, have to, they collect revenue from tickets and so forth. And obviously with the pandemic, it is horrible. Uh, so what has happened is that under the new real financing, you you will be given like you'll be paid a fee more about oper by operating the real. I think something like what SMRT has. So we think this will, will eventually occur. I mean, not sure when, but if this happens, it will be a, a catalyst for the share price because then you de-risk the model thereby. Uh, SBS Transit or Comfort, you know, don't have to rely on passenger traffic. You just get the normal fee. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. So for Singtel. Uh, the, there's no briefing, but the highlight was was the rebound in Bati Airtel of India. I think that was a major jump, and also the eleven percent jump in foreign currency. So in terms of the positives, uh, for us we were a bit surprised of Australia. So you can see the EBITDA in Australia jumped twenty three percent. Even if you strip out the eleven percent uh, surge in Australian dollar, so of course the improvement in Australian dollar will help Singtel's results because it's reported in Sing dollar. Even if you straight that out, you can see the EBITDA still was very strong. Uh, some of the reasons was the, was the mobile revenue did well. The consumer, you can see 8%. Or, or, but what we think is also, although they did not disclose, uh, we think that the last quarter, in fourth quarter of 21, they did some impairments and payroll charges. So I think they took out a lot of costs then. So, so maybe that's why uh, it looks nicer now, I mean the EBITDA. Again, 
uh, they've not actually given any replies, but I, we think that could be the possibility. But anyway, regardless, I think it's still a good number. Uh, in terms of the negatives, the enterprise was a bit slower. You can see the group enterprise there, uh, which is uh, only up 1%. Uh, sorry, it's a bit hard to see uh, year on year. Uh, and then this was surprising despite, you know, you've got data center, cyber security. You know, but I think what put them down is the legacy carriage. Because uh, voice calls, that means you know, people in the office making phone calls, it's also under enterprise and obviously nobody's in office now and, and, and nobody wants to use the ever just use whatsapp so that is the big drag for them uh, uh okay and in terms of so in terms of the results it was met our expectations the ibida was you know, roughly in line with our, our forecast uh the the positive was bati uh, we didn't put up there because the, the, it was just a one pager but uh the, the you can see that bati the red box there there was a big turnaround i think they were they were lost making about 80 million uh, last quarter, but this quarter they are up 64. So you add up, no, so this is like a hundred plus million turnaround for for Bati, and, and this lifted up the profit uh, after tax. Uh, and we're actually going to raise our associate earnings by 6%. So, in terms of the outlook, uh, the bright spots will remain Bati Atel of India and also uh, Australia business. Uh, of course, the, the, the other share price catalyst would be the corporate exercise at NCS. I mean, they, they recently just separately disclosed NCS earnings. I guess there must be a reason for that. I think there could be a listing. I mean, uh, not, uh, and also, uh, they also could be disposing some infrastructure assets. So, so this could give some, some share price uh, uh, momentum, I guess, in, in the short term. But I think for uh, the only thing about NCS is that uh, the the revenue growth, earnings growth was a bit slower, maybe like a low single or mid single to high single digit. So for us, uh, we upgrade our recommendation from neutral to accumulate. Uh, and, and just as a, as a, as a refresh, you know, um, the bulk of the valuations, as you can see, uh, we value the Singapore and Australia and the EV EBITDA. So that is roughly, you know, maybe 80 cents of our target price. So it's not very much. I mean, if the target price is 252, 70 cents is not, or 80 cents is not much. So bulk of the valuation for Singtel, as a, as a reminder, all comes from the associates. And we just mark the market there. I mean, we just mark the market to Bati, mark the market to share price since it's listed. Uh, except Indonesia, because that's not listed, because there's the, the, the mobile telco. And then we just apply a 20% discount. So that's how we get our target price of 252. And we increased it because you no know, Bati share price in, in India rose. So that's why we get this upgrade in target price. And also, the other reason is because you know, as, we, as borders start to reopen, uh, it will be a benefit for all the telcos. I think you know, when borders reopen, you can get this uh, roaming revenue back again, but you very highly dependent on opening borders with Malaysia and, and China. Uh, uh, okay, uh, next slide. So for, for Thai beverage, the results was, was, was good. I think mainly from the spirits business. Uh, again, this is just an update. Uh, they only gave revenue and EBITDA numbers, nothing else, and there was no briefing. So we'll just share whatever they, they gave. Uh, the numbers were positive. I think the, uh, I just focused mainly on, on spirits because spirits accounts for 90% of the profits. Uh, so the rest is like, you know, it's, it's al almost like a secondary commentary. So for, for the spirits business, the volumes jumped up very strongly. But of course, the comparable was weak last year. Uh, if you recall, um, last year, there was a one month, one month, no, almost a one month ban in uh, uh, alcohol consumption in around April. I mean, it's, to be precise, it's three weeks. Now. But nevertheless, um, on a quarter and quarter, the volumes only decreased 2%. You know, despite, you know, there's a pandemic reach, uh, underway now, uh, uh, record cases you know, in Thailand. So uh, the reason why volumes has been uh, resilient, uh, uh, in our view, is that most of the spirits is consumed off-premise. So off-premise means uh, they don't drink this, this uh, Thai version of sugarcane rum um, not they don't drink it in in bars in entertainment places. I mean, they drink it mainly in the villages and and maybe at home or not, some not in these premises. So that's number one. The second thing is, uh, the, a lot of workers also returning from the cities to to the to the to the village and and you know this is a con product that's consumed in the villages and also because you no know, the white spirits which is their main product is, is also the cheapest. I, I guess it's the most affordable, uh, legal. I mean inverted commas legal alcohol out there. So that's why it makes it so resilient. And also the main thing is that they also lowered their selling price expenses. Uh, the negative is food business. I think uh, food business, the EBITDA was 163, but it's still way, way below the you know, pre-pandemic, almost 500 million. 
Uh, and that's because I think it's uh, we all know uh, there's no it's only dining a lot. Uh, there's no dining and you can only take away. So in general, the results was more or less in line. I think EBITDA was 75. Or, so everything's in line. Uh, but in terms of the outlook, the ongoing closure of, of entertainment restaurants were also going to affect uh, beer sales and food outlets. Um, and because beer is mainly you know, in, in, in these places. But I think the upside has been, which has been a surprise for us, has been the ability to control costs. So you can see that the EBITDA margins actually rose, uh, although mo modestly, but that's because they are very aggressive. I think they cut, they're very aggressive in cutting costs, especially selling at expenses to adapt to the current environment. So that has been a, a, a big upside surprise for us. Uh, so we maintain buy, no, no change. We just target to the 18 price, uh, 18 times PE historical. And, and we think the spirits will be resilient as they ride through this uh, pandemic and, and they will, should, there should be a, a bigger rebound as we come off this pandemic. Uh, okay, uh, uh, next slide. Okay, uh, I think two more, two more for me. Uh, so QMN uh, results, the rebound is on track. Uh, next slide. So for q &M, the I think the revenue did uh, really well, but because Insight is also contribution from the new PCR business, uh, which they don't separately disclose about, we, can, we are just estimating. Uh, so the core dental business, the positives uh, was up about 86%. Uh, and medical equipment, which includes the PCR, I mean, like triple. Uh, and the revenue per dental clinic, which we calculated, uh, is about up 70%. But of course, the base is a bit weaker. Uh, no, because last year, virtually clinics were virtually closed, I think, because the only limited procedures you can do. Um, uh, so if you look at the negatives, is you know, for us, most important uh, for us, for q &M is the ability to open new outlets. Because their market share is only 10%. And, and I think they got very aggressive plans to, to hopefully even double their market share. So uh, they've only opened seven, which our target is uh, 20, which is our, below our forecast of 25. But they are still confident they can open the, the, the 20 in Singapore. Because in Singapore, they got another six more sites. So they can at least uh, uh, and have been secured and 10 more to be completed. So they think they can still hit the 20 new clinics in Singapore. Of course, Malaysia will be off. I mean, Malaysia will be locked down now. I'm not sure if you, you don't want to go and open any clinics right now. But uh, Malaysia's revenue per clinic is roughly only 10% of Singapore. So the results were generally in, 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 uh, within our expectations. Uh, there was a, they announced a one for five bonus issue and they also sustained their quarterly dividend. Uh, uh, they, high chance they might actually maintain their quarterly dividend because in the past, they only paid like half yearly dividends. Uh, and of course, the dividend is multiple times the last year. Uh, so we maintain our buy. Our target price dropped a bit. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons is acumen, which is basically the PCR business. It is a bit long-winded, but anyway, uh, because their associate, uh, Aosin, uh, which is listed on, on the SGX, uh, announced they're going to buy the balance acumen. Uh, okay, this is going to get a bit confusing, but anyway, acumen, the PCR, they own 51%. So now the 49% is going to be acquired by their, their associate. Uh, but the, 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 the thing that they announced when they announced the acquisition, uh, acumen valuation was 60 million. So as a result, we have to pack our valuations to this 60 million. Um, and also with the, we, as we enter to endemic stage, we can't uh, uh, group the, the valuations together because like the whole group was valued at 25 times. So we had to strip that out away. So we roll over the core and, uh, uh, okay, I think we move on to the next sliding and see that better. Uh, so for the next slide, uh, the figure one is how we value it. So this is the core valuations. Then acumen is four cents, and then the housing is four cents. Uh, and also this is just for reference. Uh, the housing new shareholding will be will be this. Uh, the table on the on the right. In the past, we valued when we initial coverage, we valued Q and M uh, on a historical PE basis, which was a bit harder because they you no know, their valuations were swinging maybe fifty times, like thirty times to fifty times. So to to uh, so we, we couldn't, it was hard to, to, to nail, it was all over the place. So, so now we, we tried to compile all the dental clinics and we kind of get like also around like 28 times FY22. So this is the whole, the table on the right here uh, is all the dental, some are equipment, some are operators, like 1,000 uh, in Australia and also in Canada. So we use this, we kind of like uh, aggregate them, we took out some of the outliers and then we got like 28 times PE. So that's how we packed the 25 times PE. Uh, of course, we can't compare with Raffles Medical. Know, that's a hospital, right? So, so ours is twenty five times PE. So, so valuations for KNM is a bit. It's not ultra transparent because it's not not. Uh, no, you can see the white disparity, but I think it's a bit better than using the historical PEs. 
Yeah, I mean, sorry, I have a very long explanation, but I mean, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, okay, I, I think we'll, we'll rush through this. Uh, this will be the last part uh, on our Singapore Weekly. So Singapore Weekly, I'll just give you an update on the, the macro, um, or whatever macro numbers that came out, the more important ones for Singapore. So there was a few, there was a lot of uh, tourist numbers. I know everyone knows it's bad, uh, so, but we're just going to run through it. I mean, we'll know, just to tell you how bad it is, uh, I guess. Uh, so in terms of visitor arrivals in Singapore in July, there was 18,500. Uh, it's much better than circuit breaker, obviously. You know, circuit breaker, nobody came. About six and a half thousand. But if you compare, uh, more important comparison is if you compare to the pre-pandemic, uh, which is July 19. Uh, July 19, you know, typically we get like 1.8 million visitors. So right now, I think you can do it very simple. I mean, we, we're only getting 1% of people coming in. Of, uh, of, of people that usually come to Singapore, only 1% of them are coming in. So you can see how... The, how uh, uh, how, how horrible that is. Uh, and the next will be on the REFPA. Uh, REFPA, just think of it like, like room rates and the, and, and the occupancy. So you can think of it like a revenue in general of a hotel operator. So the REFPA again is 87, better than the circuit breaker, but compared to pre-pandemic, $200, uh, you are down like 60%. Uh, the good news is that the exports is still holding up. So we're up 13 you know, year to date and a lot of it is driven by chemicals and pharma. And like, like what was mentioned by the, the minister, I think the good thing is that the, although uh, tourist numbers were, were disrupted, but the good thing is at least the supply, supply chain for Singapore was not disrupted and, and that allowed our exports to resume at, uh, almost like normal, I guess. So that's the positive, I guess, in, in a wider context. Uh, for US, uh, you know, we just give you some highlights, what, uh, what's, what's uh, the uh, attention of everyone. Uh, so for the US, all the chatter was about the Fed, Fed minutes being released. Uh, so the main, I mean, it's a very long document, but I guess the main highlight was that uh, a lot of the Fed officials say that they, uh, it warrants, because of the economic conditions, they warrant a reduction in asset purchases. So basically, i.e. tapering, because right now the Fed is buying mortgage securities and treasury bonds. So uh, the market took it as a signal that the tapering will be coming soon. Uh, and also... The other thing is that for inflation, they're not so seem to be worried. I think they think that inflation in the US is uh, only for a small number of categories. And also, they, some are even worried about 2% target. And, and just to remind everyone, in this inflation, how inflation works in the, in the US is, is very critical because if inflation runs, uh, is worse than we think, it runs higher than we think, it's going to be bad for all asset classes. It's going to be bad for bonds. It's going to be bad for equities. So... Know, how the inflation tracks and how the Fed responds is going to be very important for the market. I mean, I mean just to, to remind, just as a reminder. Uh, so anyway, in the US, they release also their, their retail sales. So retail sales is, is still very robust, although it's a bit slower, than the, but it's still up 16%. And, and just to give you some context, uh, in the, before the pandemic in 2019 you know, or 2018, retail sales only normally 3 to 4%. So even at 16% or 15, it's still very, very strong retail sales in, in the US. Uh, in terms of our tactical view, I think the market is still going to be a bit hesitant. I think uh, uh, the commentary is basically, you know, there's still a lot of uh, fears uh, from the Delta variant. So even though uh, there's expectations the Fed might, might announce tapering, uh, the bond yields in the US still actually went lower down for the week. So it, it shows that people are just very scared of the Delta variant resurgence. Uh, but we think, I think the, the base case is that the taper announcements will be in November. Uh, okay, anyway, we, we move on. Uh, the Poems webinar, we have two this week. We have Netlink and, and Halcyon for those who are interested. Uh, just register. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, just, just, uh, just bear me another three more slides. Uh, just an update on the COVID. I think it's still rising uh, in, in globally, although it's, uh, like, it's still rising like 20% month on month. Uh, next slide. Uh, the cases we can see in Southeast Asia is still record high. I, I didn't include Vietnam because it's, uh, it's also another record. Uh, only in, in Indonesia is coming off, but you see record cases in Indonesia, I mean, sorry, in Malaysia, Thailand, and, and this is important because we've got a bit of a manufacturing base there for listed Singapore uh, list coast. Now, the good news is China is coming off. So China, the cases is back to, it's off the highs in June and it's back to almost the normal rates in, in, in April. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so for Singapore, uh, the cases is, is, is collapsing. And uh, there's, uh, like, um, so you can see from the table, we are now back lower down, lower than the, the COVID 
so our circuit breaker time, which was about 50 over cases. So now we're about 30 plus case, cases per day. But the only thing is that the unlink is still high, it's about 17 versus 11. Uh, and the good news is that we are like, first dose is already 82. So for VTL vaccine meter travel lanes, uh, which is the one that all of us preparing for, no, I'm just kidding, uh, for Germany. The only thing just to note that uh, for a visitor to come into Singapore, you need uh, four PCR tests. So that's why I think just to link it back to KNM, the uh, PCR test will still be required. I think you got to do one PCR test before you come, before, uh, during, uh, upon arrival and after. So before, during and after, you got to do like four four PCR tests if you want to come back from Germany, by the way, just to, as a reminder. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's it for me. Uh, uh, next slide, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. I think we can move on to, to questions. Thank you. Hello, so I think there are a few questions on SGX. Maybe I, uh, I'll just amalgamate them and then just answer. But I think the, the bulk of the questions are, uh, please comment on the recent SGX sharp drop of prices. Uh, and then also a, the target price for this stock going forward, please. So there are actually three reasons uh, why 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 the oh, there, there are actually one one main reason why the the the, the share price of SGX dropped today is because the the Hong Kong exchange got approval to to launch the FTSE China A fifty contract. Now this A fifty China contract is significant for SGX. It's the top contract for SGX in the last few years and. For first half 21, uh, it's formed over about 40% of its overall derivatives volume. Uh, and and or, or this is three times higher than its next highest contract, the Nifty 50. So that the A50 is, is, is critical. Second, second reason why the, the China A50 contract is very important for SGX is because it's a monopoly. When SGX have this, it's a monopoly status for them because this was the only HS futures available offshore for investors. So previously, for offshore investors who want exposure to the China A50 contracts, this was the only way that they can get the shares, the, the only way they can get exposure to the China A50 futures. But now, with Hong Kong offering it, obviously, uh, SGX kind of lose that advantage. Uh. So we just did some very quick calculation. Uh, if assuming uh, and Hong Kong exchange takes some contracts from them, this, this we estimate now, but this is just back of the envelope. We expect, estimate about 10 to 12% uh, revenue headwind for SGX for from 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 uh Hong Kong exchange getting this contract so that, that is significant for for SGX we we we, we haven't uh run through the, the, the we haven't uh, uh do a more detailed model but that's what we're expecting at the moment yeah just maybe run through and see if there's any more questions on SGX and if, if you have any questions also just feel free to put in the comments uh, gen gen gentle reminder to put the any questions you have in the, the Q and A chat, of course. Yeah, let's go. Um, I think my, most of the questions are uh, on on why SGX dropped. Uh, and then, sorry, Paul, you got something to add in, also. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, but but just to remind everyone, uh, this is not the first time uh, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is going to continue to launch a lot. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Terence. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. going to continue to launch a lot of MSCI products. But you've seen some of the earlier launches. I think uh, SGX continued to cope well with, with, with this. I think there were a few MSCI products launched, but the volumes, were, uh, uh, as they transition, you know, like 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 uh, Taiwan and so forth, they transition MSCI Taiwan to FTSE. So SGX has transitioned well. And ultimately, people will go to where the volume is. Uh, so, so even if you launch the MSCI, but there's no volume, uh, I think there will be some impact, but I think... Um, SGX has gone through many times like this and the, the share price has always rebounded because uh, the volume is still here uh, and there's all, all these margin requirements. So, uh, so just a, re a reminder for everyone, I mean, this not to over uh, overreact. Uh, they, they've coped with this, and but do expect uh, Hong Kong will continue to, uh, uh, Hong Kong will continue to launch more MSCI products. So that's a done deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Taran, to interrupt me. Yeah. Oh yeah, thanks. But but so on a related point, you reminded me also, Paul, that they 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 they, they did a similar exercise also in 2019 when they launched the MSCI products. So when they launched the MSCI products, the uh in, in Hong Kong, HGX also took a little bit uh, of hit. But like what Paul mentioned, also they, they obviously they try to 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 uh buffer this by by buffer this by by having try to promote their multi asset exchange now. So that's that's how they try to cope. There's one question here. Uh, Terence, any update on DBS, UOB, and OCBC 
the for in terms of the for the three banks, uh, we 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 are we are in the midst of preparing our Singapore banking money. But the I, I guess what what you mean is uh any update on DBS on the three banks after the the announcement of the lifting of the dividend cap. So, uh, I think right now what they're trying to do is try to uh cope uh with the the this some of the loan moratoriums that are coming due. Uh, they try to manage the MPLs. But if 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 you talk about other than those uh, MPLs that they're trying to manage, the underlying business remain resilient for for the group. So the on that front is it, is actually still there. It's still business as usual. Loan loans growth. Uh, we're still expecting mid single digit. The, the banks are guiding for high single digit, but we kept it at about five percent. Uh, for for some of the banks because the first half twenty one across the board, they were they were loan growth was just about three percent. So we we think it would be around there. Then, uh. For for the the fee income is also expected to grow by about twenty two percent. Uh, we we expect for for going forward, we think what will be a a catalyst for the three banks. Uh, following the 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 dividend cap lift would be uh the banks uh credit costs coming down. So when the bank's credit costs come down, they can I think they can, what they will do is also to write back some of the general provisions that they, that they did. And when they when they do when they write back some of these general provisions, then their net profit will see an uplift. And then what they, they, they do, we think the next catalyst will be uh, the banks actually distributing some of these uh, dividends out to shareholders if they cannot find any use. Um, also recall that they were reviewing the, the city group assets that, that was up for 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 uh, disposal earlier in the year. So if if they are able to to acquire or, or engage in some uh, M&A activity, then that would be that be good for the bank, like, especially in terms of uh, increasing their exposure overseas. So 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 that's 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 all for the banks. Uh, uh, I'll go on. There's one question in, in the chat, but let's probably answer this. Uh, does SCI still have ex exposure to? Samcorp Marine and thus have to pick up the three is to two rights. So, uh, no. Uh, the, the short answer is no. Samcorp Industries, uh, uh, they, they, they have no exposure to Samcorp Marine already. What happened was last year they, they actually did a restructuring exercise. So, all their exposure, what they got was for the two, $2.1 billion loan that they got for that, that Samcorp Marine took from the parent. This was exchange for Samcorp Marine shares. Uh, so, the debt was converted to Sam Marine shares. And then these shares were actually distributed to all Samcorp industry shareholders already. So, uh, in, in terms of a di dividend in species, so the the the, the parent co Samcorp Industries no longer have any uh, exposure to Sam Marine. These these shares are now with the Samcorp industry shareholders, depending on whether you have sold it already. But the short answer is is no. Uh, yeah. So I think that's 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 all the questions so far. Uh, I'll I'll go to the back. And pass the rest of my colleagues. All right. Um, thank you, Terence. Um, so I think that's quite a related number of counters that's addressed to me. So uh, without further ado, I will just go through them and then I'll pass my time back to my colleague for other questions. All right. Uh, so for first one, I think SGX is a hot topic today. Like what Terence has already mentioned earlier on, on, on why a share price drop and then what is the future outlook. Uh, perhaps let's look at the, the technicals uh, over here. So uh, first up, I think um q has been begin to surface since the start of august um and then our price has been like dropping uh it, it did rebound at the resistance support zone at 10.48 to 10.66 however i think uh last friday was a sign of warning already and today it just get down heavily uh this like a, a breakaway gap uh because i think it get and then it, if it close below this resistance support zone then it's likely that um the SGX will follow down towards the support zone one at nine dollars sixty five to nine dollars seventy five cent before we go. All right, so uh, temporarily, if you look at the moving averages, uh, we are at the downtrend for now. Okay, uh, so I think the next question is uh, how high uh, biotech? So um, basically, you can see that there is like a, a like a, a head and shoulder with a right shoulder that's a bearish pattern. Uh, it has been fulfilled. Prices have really break below the support uh, at 73 to $80.20. Hence, I think price is going to test lower. Uh, furthermore, I think prices has uh, also trend below the 200-day exponential moving average. 
All right. Uh, despite this um, oversold at the RSI, um, chances are price is going to retest and then um, have a, a, another downfall. Uh, preferably support remains at around $6.40 to $50 region. Okay. Uh, AEM is, uh, okay, AEM is a bit tricky. Uh, first of all, I think you can look here, it's a, a, like a double top. Uh, but however, I think you can look at here, um, price rebounded slightly. Um, but price if price is going to reject uh, $4.11 to $4.15 uh, region, then this may be a potential future um, head and shoulder form, uh, head and shoulder for formation. All right, and then uh, price might, might just um, go down on the downside. Uh, find its support at three dollars sixty-eight uh, to three dollars sixty-four cents region before rebound. All right. Uh, so for EM, just take note. Um, don't be fooled by the rebound. I think uh, since it, it broke out of the um, bullish flag, yes, it did. It did break out, but um, A very uh, uh, we can't hear you, Aaron. I think you're, you there's some static at your side, Aaron. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, now is it better now? Uh, still a little bit of static. Yeah. I'm not sure. Is there something like your uh, the mic? Yeah. Can, can you test again? Sorry. Uh, can you just try again? Yeah. I'm not very yeah, sure. It's better now. It's better now. Yeah. It's better okay, now. Okay. So, no problem. Uh. Okay. So for for AEM, right? Um, any downside for okay uh, over that this region uh, is already a very deep pullback and then any rebound will likely be kept. So it, it, it's more of like a momentum re re really kind of like a chance. All right. Um, so next one will be Maple Tree Commercial Trust. Um, despite a uh, weakening of the resistance zone um, at 2 dollars 17 cents to 2 dollars 20 cents uh, over a span of like uh, one year, all right, uh, a year plus. Um, prices likely to be range bound. Uh, despite price, uh, you know, have a have a strong uh, like like a like, like a bullish kind of like a, a bullish flag. But um, any and this um this momentum really really scares me off. Um, so I remain neutral on Maple Tree Commercial Trust. All right, so um, not much view on this. Um, for Maple Tree Industrial Trust. Uh, bullish flag uh, is forming. Uh, this morning was a uh, and last Friday was a great uh, bullish upside. But I think price is going to um to test on the upside. Uh, preferably, I think we're looking at three dollar four cents to three dollar ten cents. All right. Uh, if this one is going to break up on the upside, then it will be a very good uh, a signal for Maple Tree Industrial Trust. Um, for Capital Land in uh, CICT, CICT has been range bound um, ever since I've issued a report based on this breakout of the bullish flag. I think it's over from here. Uh, it has been range bound, uh, support has been tested. So let's hope that this tweezer bottom um, can, can main, this bullish candle can maintain like this and then remain as a tweezer bottom so that there will be a chance to test the upper resistance zone at $2.32 to $2.26. Uh, if it breaks up, uh, that will be uh, the, the best case scenario. But however, I think that uh, we may only observe that in the midterm. All right. Um, I think I think this this um this CFO CIGT, right? Um, once it reach through on forty cents, then there will be a major correction. All right. Uh, otherwise, I think uh one dollar ninety one cents to one dollar ninety five cents support um offer a good very good support base for rebound. All right, so um, you can kindly look at that uh, for the moment. Um, next one will be Cap City Developments, uh, CDG. Um, okay, so Capital Land. Okay, so um, uh, he has rejected the, the resistance zone uh, despite a strong rebound. Uh, prices, is, I remain my uh, uh, sell down towards the support zone at $6.31 to $6.34. All right, uh, the whole thing remains on the... Uh, bearish down trend, um, and then uh, prices is still trending below them. Um, wait, let me see the um, okay. So, for comfort down group, group, um, I still re remain neutral on that. Um, not much signal. Um, one dollar 41 cents to one dollar 45 cents remain my uh target uh for rebound. 
Okay, so next one, eye fast, eye fast, head and shoulder pattern forming. Uh, you can look at the volume. It did indeed it did confirm the head and shoulder uh, formation, but not really confirmed, but uh, enhance the probability of uh, head and shoulder forming. So hence, I think this major support zone uh, will be a crucial test at $7.56 to $7.86. So uh, we need to know much further uh, on whether head and shoulder will, will be broken or not. So if it breaks, then we're likely to see $6.86 uh, at the uh, next target uh, support zone uh, and $7 as well. Uh, UMS, UMS um, rebounded at the immediate resistance and support zone. Uh, however, I do not think that uh, it is a, it's a, actually a good buy. So yeah, um, not, very, um, not very crucial on that. Thank you. Um, Wilma, Wilma, um, last week I shared, I, I thought that this um, bullish rebound is going to break resistance zone one. However, it, before it even reach support zone one, it forms a double top, uh, prices break down. So hence, this support zone is very crucial at $4.13 to $4.29. Uh, whether it rebound or not, uh, it, it really sees the tomorrow candle, but highly chance it, it might just go down to three, $3.92. All right, Innotech, uh, I think it's on a bearish downtrend already. So um, uh, first of all, why? Uh, because I think price has really break down below the uh, gap down, below the 63-day EMA. And then uh, right now, there's this uh, testing on support zone. Um, so right now, um, we re really need to remain neutral to see what's the momentum behind, uh, how, how strong it will get uh, going forward. All right. Uh, Hong Kong exchange, uh, neutral, uh, despite its gap up today, uh, this resistance uh, at 490 to 501, Hong Kong dollars will remain a, a, a key crucial uh, point. Um, but despite that, um, I, 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 do plot, I have plotted a symmetrical triangle formation, which is kind of like a pattern in a, in a bullish ups, um, continuation setting. So let's see how it's going to, it's going to, uh, to perform going forward. Um, SMIC initially, I didn't really want to share about this uh, because I remain neutral upon this. Uh, despite uh, uh, upside, I think resistance zone has been uh, tested and go down. Um, you can see from the moving average is very ranging. Uh, hence, I do not have any um, um, comments on SMIC. But SMIC, I think $60 and $17 and 75 cents, um, this support zone might be offer a better support um, going forward. Uh, 1799, um, I think, I think, uh, remain neutral as well. Uh, but just look at this Harami, uh, come, uh, bullish, uh, bullish hammer. Let's see if you, you can continue to go up further or not. All right. So, uh, if it goes up further, then immediate target price, we can look at $20 and $26, $22.62. Um, Thai Bears performed relatively well since it's rebound from the major support at $6 as, um, 63, um, 0 0.635 to 0 0.650. Um, price is going to target the emitted resistance zone at 6710 to 715. If it breaks, uh, then we can look at long term target at 780 to 800 going forward. Uh, QNM um, just entered into a minor bearish down zone. We can see that there's a bearish divergence over here. All right, and then it confirms the sell down. Uh, despite that, I think it's going to look for major support at 0 0.640 going forward. Uh, Fraser Center Point Trust, uh, prices is currently testing on the support at 2.22 uh, to 2.30. Let's see how it's going to perform. Uh, lastly, on Food Empire, not much um, um, opinion. Uh, if this bullish uh, hammer actually um, performs relatively well, like uh, there's a successfully candle bullish upside, then I'll say that, okay, the uptrend has remained because of A, B, C, D, E. Um, but uh, sad to say, uh, this consolidative with a lot of bearish candle is kindly, is highly, highly um, oppressive for now. So hence, and beside that, uh, prices has closed below the 200-day uh, moving average. So uh, temporarily is entering into a downtrend for now. All right. So with that, I end off my uh, technical sharing. I'll pass my time back to my colleague. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. 
Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will take the next question on Fortress and LHN. So there's this question for Fortress and LHN, please comment on the weak share price prices and the outlook. So um, firstly, for Fortress, um, of course, the share price is still, um, we are still expecting it to be largely impacted by the iron ore um, prices. So with regards to the demand and supply for iron ore, um, China has been actually cutting the steel production effectively. So according to World Steel um, for June, the, the steel production was already down 5.6% um, from May. And reasons for this, of course, could include that, you know, with the high iron ore input prices, they want to cut the steel production to cap the input cost. So if, for example, um, the iron ore price increased from about 100 at the start of this year um, to more than 200 before the recent fall in the prices, then that would mean that their um, input prices will have doubled. So that is one factor. And the other thing is um, they are also trying to ensure their self-sufficiency in the iron ore supply. So you can see that um, with also the Sino-Australia geopolitical tensions, they are trying to rely less on Australia, which has been the major um, importer a major exporter of iron ore globally, and majority majority of it is exported to China. Yep, and the third um, factor is um, the with this self sufficiency and the increase the higher steel production levels for the um, the first few months of this year, they have also been getting um, higher steel scrap from the. Um, production of steel, the process of the steel production. So they have, um, they are also able to use this steel scrap in the process of um, production of steel from iron ore. And this actually helps to um, meet carbon emission reduction targets and also at the same time reduce the heavy reliance on iron ore. Yep. And the um, last factor affecting um, the China's demand, China's demand would be the um, Winter Olympics that is due to happen next year. So um, China could be cutting steel production to ensure the good air quality for the Winter Olympics. And we have seen um, the effectiveness of you know, their um, drastic measures to, to um, reduce this kind of uh, production processes that could that cause pollutive um, air quality. So back in 2008, you know, when they said that, oh, um, we are gonna help to, sorry, to make the air quality improve, and that was actually very effective. So this is also um, expected for the Winter Olympics due next year. Yeah, and um, but still, in the mid to long term, of course, you know, with the infrastructure plans from the uh, major economies like US and China, that could still keep um, iron ore demand um, to be elevated as compared to the previous years. Yeah, and the last... Um, factor for the last um, comment that I have for this would be that um, the, sub, the iron ore prices could be under um, some certain level of downward pressure due to the fact that supplies from Australia and Brazil and also possibly South Africa, the major iron ore producers of the world, are likely to rise um, with, and this is um, together with China's restrictions on steel production. So before, before this, um, fall in iron ore prices, China has been, no, they have been um, forecasting that, oh, China is going to ramp up their steel production. So they are also, you know, trying to ramp up their iron ore supplies. But now with the chi with China's restrictions on steel production and um, increasing supplies from there, that could be a downward pressure in that sense. But anyway, for Fortress Minerals themselves, so they are still, um, trying to ramp up their production, but there hasn't been a lot of, um, I would say, public information about this. So um, they have announced that they um, acquired this Fortress Mangapu, this new mining concession, um, that uh, we are expecting them to commence commercial production pro pro probably in the, uh, in, by the mid of next year, 2022. But there hasn't been, you know, a lot of a lot of communication to investors of um, how this is going to contribute to their revenue growth. So that could be one um, factor for the uh, recent um, depressed share price of Fortress Minerals. Yep. And um, moving on to um, LHN. So um, LHN share price has slightly fallen from I think about thirty seven cents to around 
um, to 33.5 cents um, today. So um, I think a few factors for this again. Firstly, I think um, more investors could be um, have the assumption that LHN's main customer group is still within the foreigners uh, still from the foreigners. So for example, um, they, do, they do this thing called um, space optimization. So they um, acquire these buildings and transform them to get the, um, to, to, to segregate them into smaller rooms before renting them out to um, tenants who want to stay. So possibly people could have the impression that, oh, um, their major customer group could be from the foreigners, but actually um, they have been also facing more demand from locals. So a reason for this is that, um, you know, like within the, so during the circuit breaker, as more people stay at home um, all day, um, especially the young professionals, they have the economic ability and they also, um, the, the conditions could possibly have made them realize that, oh, um, I want to actually move out of my house to stay. So they have been seeing more demand from um, locals, like young professionals. That is one factor. Yeah. And um, sorry, the next thing is on uh, just a moment. Oh, um, so for LHN, for this, um, this sector that they derive around 50% um, of their revenue from, um, Basically, it's um, this this residence is called Koliu, so residential under the segment residential properties under Koliu. There is still this um, very attractive terms like flexible leasing. You know, if you go and rent a condo or a HDB, um, the minimum rental is around I think three to six months. But for Koliu, the minimum is about seven days. But of course, uh, most don't stay for seven days. They try to. Um, they receive most requests for at least um, two weeks to a month. Yep. And if you compare to um, hotels, Kaliu has um, the, it, it involves, uh, I think it's either daily cleaning or cleaning every two days. So there's this added um, advantage um, if you compare Kaliu to the um, hotels. Yep. So for, on the outlook, of course, I'm still very positive. They, Recently, I think not recently, the last announcement that they had was they acquired this building to transform into um, the Kaliwu spaces. So they are expanding the Kaliwu segment very aggressively. So on the outlook, um, it's still very positive for them. Yeah, uh, so that's all for me. Oh, sorry, I think there is one more question. I saw it at the bottom just now. Um, I think the question was with regards to whether uh, we think that the ICI fall prices, so I think that's with regards to the presentation on gear, whether it will continue increasing in the next three to six months. So for the ICI fall prices, it is linked to this energy coal or also known as thermal coal. And this um, energy or thermal coal is used to um, produce, uh, in the process of combustion, it is used to generate, um, produce steam to run your turbines to produce electricity. So you know, as compared to things like iron ore or steel production, electricity, electricity is something that you cannot um, live without. So of course, we are still expecting, it will be reasonable to expect that the demand for um, this uh, electricity and in turn, um, the demand for thermal and energy coal to continue rising. And also with the um, winter season coming soon in December in, in China. So yeah, um, I think, it's reasonable to say that um, possible that it could continue um, at an, to be an, at, at an elevated level. Yeah, that's all for me. Um, I'll now be passing the time on to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll take one question for me. Uh, for Capital Land, should China introduce new cooling measures or additional regulations for properties? What will be the impact on CLI? So um, these cooling measures are actually targeted at the retail housing market. And um, moving on to CLI, uh, the development side of the business will then be privatized. So uh, in short, actually, there will not be much of an impact to CLI. Um, if you want to look at it from a very, very, very remote um, basic, uh, point of view, it could, uh, you know, some of the developers that are under pressure and, you know, have to meet their, their various financial ratios um, could potentially want to divest some of their commercial assets and, you know, maybe, maybe Capital Land want to pick them up. But, but on, the, on the 
on a very broad view, actually, there's no impact to CRI with regard to these cooling measures. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, let me just try to take uh, the, the nano flame question. Um, okay, we, we, we don't cover nano flame, uh, but, but I mean, the question is can share insights on what caused the plunge in nano flame? Uh, I, I, I think, I don't, I don't, we don't cover, uh, um, I, I think there are three reasons. Uh, the first reason is that before the results came up, I think there were quite a bit of upgrades. I think the reason there were upgrades uh, was because uh, their major customer, customer Z, which is the largest phone maker in the world, uh, which they never made, mentioned who is it. But if you go, if you go Google and you look at Apple supplier list, you're going to look under fine nano film. You actually find them. But again, I do not know who customer Z is. But um, there was there were some expectations that because customer Z, uh, the, the results was very good. So there were some upgrades before the results. So so now, number one, the expectations were high. Uh, number two, uh, when the results came out, they were hit by by some one-offs inverted comma uh, there was a two go, okay first half they made like 18 million so it was flat but they were hit by almost 6 million of uh, inverted comma one offs uh, half of it was due to diesel again don't ask me how what is the logic what uh, don't, don't ask me why but anyway because they their Shanghai plant couldn't operate so they had to spend money on, on diesel uh, because they had to use some special cable in Shanghai, but uh, that didn't come up, uh, didn't, didn't turn on in time, so they spent money to fuel the diesel generator. Right? I mean, that, that's the stick as it is. Uh, but uh, then the other the rest was because of new product introductions. But again, if you're going new introductions, I'm not sure why is that one off. But anyway, so the expectations were, were high. The, the, and then the results, first half results didn't come in because of this first half, uh, because of these one off items. And, and of course, the valuation has always been high. I think even after you down, after all the recent downgrades, the PE for this stock for FY21 is about 40 times PE. So I think that's the reason. Uh, in terms of outlook, uh, and the fourth reason, sorry, uh, they also, uh, one of the major, pro one of the projects that, uh, which was supposed to do well, uh, became end of life, was some lens project, uh, which they said abruptly, the customer decided not to continue. They were supposed to be the, I think the sole supplier. And, and this project didn't continue. So, so these were some of the reasons. Uh, in terms of the outlook, um, it will be again customer Z and also uh, with more variables products. And so that will be the outlook. And of course, hydrogen, but I know hydrogen, I mean, probably like five cars a year or something. But anyway, that was more like 2022 N or something. So, so that's the outlook. But I think ultimately it's the valuations are high. I mean, so, so uh, I think in, when you don't really meet expectations, so, uh, you know, you get this major sell down. Yeah. Again, I, I can't comment what's the outlook. I don't really follow, but I just tell you, share what I, I understand the situation is. Uh, I hope that helped. Uh, the next question is, uh, hi, Paul, uh, able to include Hong Kong market or stocks in your weekly market call going forward? Uh, uh, we have to apologize for that. I think we, because we are, we are covering only Singapore, so we can't really talk about Hong Kong. You know, it's like the same, unless the, our Hong Kong uh, team comes in and talk, and, and, and talk about the Hong Kong market. Because we have a Hong Kong team of analysts. You know, it's like the Hong Kong analysts talking about Singapore market. I mean, nobody will want to listen to them. Likewise, if Singapore talk about Hong Kong, I don't think anybody will want to listen to us. Not that they are listening now anyway. Okay. Uh, next one. Uh, any updates on why Union Gas dropped so much? Uh, 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 so sorry, we don't really follow. Uh, we, we try to have meetings with them. Uh, they, they just kind of just ignore us, I think. Uh, next one, Tuan Sing. I think we are we, we don't really follow. So uh, the question is, uh, what is your take on Tuan Sing? Sorry, we don't really follow. Uh, I think unless these companies do some separate briefings for analysts, we if they don't want to share, it's very hard for us to give some some insights apart from from you know, the the announcements which we uh, we haven't really gone through. Um, I, I think the next one will be Chai Hui. If you have anything on HR, yeah. thanks. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so next question is, how is HRNet leveraging on digital technology? So for HRNet, right, um, HRNet has been investing in digital technology for a while now. Um, it has an app called Ease, um, which provides for contactless um, one-touch check-ins um, on mobile. 
uh, it does leave applications and basically assess as well. So for operations in Singapore, um, this is actually integrated with my info um, to draw in SingPass data also to fill out um, required information with ease. Lah. So that's the whole point of the app. Then um, HNA is also building um, this app called Knock Knock. It's a digital employment platform where um, it drives um, the, in order to drive the flexible staffing product into onto mobile. And other developments include um, a WeChat mini app uh, for contractors to enhance, uh, sorry, for contractor employees to enhance um, the, user the, the user experiences of um, clients and contractors. So all in, um, I guess this wraps up um, their initiative to digitalize um, all touch points in the client and candidate journey, um, which in our opinion is app um, to transform together with the increasing, increasingly digital um, HR in industry. So I think um, there's another question on Yoma. So the question is, um, hi, please comment on Yoma, who are their backers and, um, and can you elaborate on the prospects? So for Yoma, um, we just had a management call with them last Friday. In terms of prospects, it's still not looking very bright. Uh, this company's outlook um, is largely tied to the economic conditions in Myanmar. And now Myanmar, uh, as you know, is suffering from the ongoing coup as well as uh, COVID-19. So with the third wave of um, COVID hitting them, hitting the country hard, Myanmar has announced stay-at-home orders um, in a six townships in ten regions from uh, 17 July to 15 August. So we are expecting this um, to impact the top and bottom line for the coming quarter, and this is mostly due to the impact from the motors business, um, given that the showrooms, the car showrooms, are shut for business. That's it. Um, 3Q21's op, um, core operating EBITDA is still positive. Gross profit is still able to cover interest expense. Yoma has even paid down, I think, about 10 million worth of gross loans and extended repayment uh, for several loans. So during this period of time, um, Yoma also cut OPEX and defer non-essential non CAPEX. Um, staff costs were slashed um, by more than 60% through job cuts, furloughs, and pay reductions. So I think if I'm not wrong, um, the CFO, Chairman, uh, they have both uh, voluntary uh, uh, say that they will be different. They will be cutting their um salary, uh, for the foreseeable for the foreseeable future. Then, uh, in terms of their cash balance, right now is is actually higher, uh, than that of second quarter, and so I think yeah, just to wrap things up, this is how Yuma is holding up during this period of time. Uh, the report will likely be released in released in due time. Uh, so for more details, um, you can look at that. For the shareholdings portion, uh, the major shareholders are Sach Pan, uh, which is who is the the chairman of Yoma, and also Ayala Corporation. So some so some color on Ayala. Ayala is the oldest and one of the largest conglomerates in Philippines, uh, with similar core interests as uh, as as Yoma, uh, being real estate, banking, telecommunications, and also power. Uh, in November twenty nineteen. Uh, Yala has invested about US $155 million, uh, for, for a maximum 20% stake in Yoma, making it the second largest shareholder. So this move uh, is a key part of an overall, uh, I think, two, close to $240 million investment by Yala into Yoma, which actually, made, um, which actually makes this the largest uh, FDI made by a Philippine company into Myanmar. The placement was done at $0.45 cents, uh, sing per share. And the second tranche of 46 million is still ongoing. So I think it might be key to note that uh, Ayala has not pulled out, has not pulled out of the of the deal to invest um, the 46 million in Yoma at 45 cents per share. This amount has already be, been um, pre-funded to Yoma in the form of debt. So um, Yoma is sorry, so Ayala is uh, still committed to the deal. Yeah, I think this kind this answers the question. Uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, you may uh, type in the chat below. I'll pass my down to my colleagues. Yeah, thanks, Yekwe. I think I'll just, I'll just take out the questions on the banks. How about OCBC being dropping after dividend? So just, just for the benefit of those who, who missed the, our OCBC report for their first quarter 21 results, the I, I think the concern for us, or, or for OCBC at this, this moment is, in the first quarter, of 2021, they were actually very bullish. Uh, they, they thought the, the I think when in terms of their outlook, the 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 the, the credit uh their couple they 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 toned down their credit costs, the outlook stabilized. They in fact they 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 guided for 
credit costs to remain low. But in second quarter of 2021, in their, their, their second quarter results, we actually saw uh, their credit costs actually spiking because of general provision. So just for perspective, in the first quarter of 2021, they actually made a $9 million uh, general provision and kind of guided that it's really at the bottom. Uh, they don't expect to make more general provisions for the year. In fact, we, if, if we take what they say, we, we were expecting to see general provisions actually reverse uh, coming possibly in the second quarter, at least in the second half of 2021. But obviously, in the second quarter of 2021, we, we saw a, a sudden spike in the kind of general provisions. And the outlook for general provisions actually uh, is it, a little bit more cautious than they were because uh, of their exposure to 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 uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. So uh, probably let's take, it, take the other question as well. Uh, let's read out. Uh, what Are you breaking off, Terence? Sorry, I think Terence got disconnected. I thought it was me. Yeah, I, I think you got disconnected, uh, Terence. Oh, wow. And you're yeah, referring sorry. to second. Uh, and you're referring to second quarter, right? Uh, not not first quarter, right? Yeah. Yeah, second quarter. Second quarter. Okay. Of okay. Sorry, okay. sorry, I got this. Yeah, not sure why. But the, so for sec for second quarter, uh, DBS actually continued their reversal of general provisions. You will be also. Uh, lower the the credit cost for UOB actually came in lower than what they were expecting. So this was this was good for uh, DBS and, and UOB. So in terms of the three banks, the OCBC is the one with the more cautious outlook in terms of uh, uh, provisions for for these these impairments, especially going to, to second half uh, versus DBS and UOB who, who are a little bit more optimistic about the outlook. So for that reason, we think that's the reason why OCBC uh, is is falling a lot more. Uh, in our last uh, second quarter update on the three banks, we upgraded DBS to $32 target price uh, and upgraded uh, UOB to $29. And uh, for OCBC, we actually parted it down a little bit to $14.22. We, we brought it down because of the more cautious outlook uh, for OCBC. Yeah, so I think that's all for me. For the, the, the I, I'll see if there's any more questions for me. Uh, is, is there a way to get the daily as opposed to weekly net institution buys and sells of SGX from your trading platform? The business times only provide them on a weekly basis on Monday. Uh, no, because this data is actually from SGX. Huh? So SGX actually compiles this uh, net institution buy and net retail buy and sell uh, on a on a on a weekly basis, so so we, we we even us we don't get it on get on a daily basis. Yeah. What's a good price to buy DBS and UOB? I think this question is for Raven. Yeah, so probably let him chime in. Uh. Yeah, that, that's all for me. I'll hand over the time to my colleagues. Okay. Uh, in in view of time, um, I uh, will ju just. Try to end it off because we uh Viren has another one at one o'clock. Uh, so, so let, let me just answer this question. Uh, why Q and M price drop so much? Uh, I think there could there are likely two uh possibilities. I think the firstly is the as you know the one of the uh, ma uh, major growth drivers uh, earnings growth drivers has been the PCR test. So right now we, as we go into endemic, there is a bit of uncertainty. Um, number one. How how frequent will you be using the the and and the, of course right now you visitors coming in they're gonna be tested four times or so so or even twice if you're in the so called category one, uh, but but again that has crept up so there's a bit more uncertainty as, as to how sustainable that is, uh, number one and number two uh uh oh, sorry number one and, and also because the um so what we think is gonna happen is PCR tests will still be there but there will be some consolidation on the vendors. I think uh, the, the vendors, uh, um, I think they were like, I think more than 10, I think. So the number of people that will be providing this, I think the authorities are going to consolidate. So, so that would be the situation. And anyway, we've really kind of factored in lower uh, lower PCR tests and also kind of revalued downwards the PCR business. Uh, the, the second thing will be on the dental. Uh, uh, again, 
the big the big jump that we saw uh is um we we rebound so people are a bit nervous whether is this all about uh because of the border closure so everyone just going to dentist because they cannot go out so we don't think that is so because even when we compare to 2019 uh the improvement is only about five percent so compared to pre-pandemic the revenue per clinic is about uh up roughly five percent so it's not like a huge surge compared to last year it was uh, so so that's why uh, opening of new clinics is, is very important. I think they got very very aggressive plans. I, I think they they even want to double it. I think I I, I, I my guess. Uh, so so um, opening of new clinics is the main main thing for them if they want to keep the growth. Huh? And of course, uh, the other hidden one is uh, is Alcin. I mean, don't, don't talk about the acumen part. But Alcin, uh, if the profitability is starting to 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 come in, and once that that comes in, that will be another support to the to the earnings because. It's very lumpy because they, you know, as we mentioned, you know, the Aosin where they own forty over percent in China. Uh, these are very very huge hospitals which take some time for the gestation. So once that turn EBITDA positive, uh, you can see that swing in profit very fast because you know there's a high fixed cost for them. Uh, again, I, I hope I answered it. It's a bit long an answer, Daniel. Uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I think we might have to end. So uh, 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 a bit uh, sorry we missed out some. Um, uh, on the market, why Hong Kong market is down recently? MC payments are really not sure. I think if uh, if they do a briefing or they do a webinar, we'll help you on that. Uh, wh wh why Wilma? Uh, I think Wilma was because after the listing of of the Hong Kong, the Chinese subsidiary, I think a bit of that momentum kind of slid, and also there's a bit of worry of the crush margins, which is another part of the business. Uh, again, not, not, a, not an expert of Wilma, so take it as it, 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 it is. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, let me just answer the last one. Um, how will Singtel be affected by, by 5G? Um, I, th I think it could be incrementally positive for now. I think what we've seen is some of the price plans, uh, the pricing is a bit... Uh, some of the, I think when you go and renew your price plans now, I think they're trying to push in the 5G thing. 5G element, I think pricing is starting to creep out a little bit. Uh, but, but again, the thing is not to go and rejoice because ultimately, uh, you, you just worry when 5G becomes more mainstream, the price competition will come in again. So, but for right now, in the very short term, there seems to be some positive impact by raising, nudging up prices. Uh, but of course, the longer term thing is whether 5G can, can you know, there's a killer app, which I don't see there's any right now, but anyway, that is the hope. Yeah, I hope that, that, that answers. Uh, uh, yeah, all our webinars are on the YouTube. Yeah, and one one last thing, um, you know, on all this institutional flow that you get, uh, that the question the earlier attendee asked, uh, thank you for the question. But just always remember, you know, when you get all this institutional flow, you have to know whether is is this predictive uh, data, you know, whether the institutional flow you get is it predictive, or is it, uh, well, if there are more institutional buying, is it good or is it bad? I mean, we never really done our study ourselves, but. Uh, it's important to took note into that. I mean, institutional buying now, you know, does it mean they continue buying next week? Or, or will they buy more? Will they buy less? So the value of this institu institutional flows that you get from SGX, you have to really check uh, whether is that predictive value to it. Uh, or is just no coincidental you know, institutional buying, the market is up. But what about next week? Is, uh, is institutional buying coming down? Yeah, okay, and anyway, uh, uh, without taking any more time, uh, if any more questions, uh, no, please post in our Stocks BNB website. Uh, we will try to 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 uh, answer them. And and with that, I think uh, we should end this and and take care, everybody, and and hope you have a good uh, a good week ahead. And thanks for joining us, and especially all your questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, and, and take care, everyone.